Good evening. It's a great pleasure to introduce the new webinar program of the European Reference Network for Rare Urogenital Diseases and Complex Conditions, called Eurogen. We will be running monthly webinars in collaboration with the ESU. The Eurogen webinar aims to increase knowledge about rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions and is targeted at healthcare professionals working in the field of urology. It's a great honour to introduce Professor Chris Chappell, consultant urological surgeon here at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals and Secretary General of the EAU. And we really thank you, Chris, for speaking about surgical approaches to rare and complex urethral conditions. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Excuse my state of dress, but I've, we're in the middle of a complex case anyway in the operating theatre, which came up. What I'm going to talk about this evening is contemporary management of complex urethral stricture disease. And in this context, we have about 30 minutes for the presentation and then around 15 minutes for discussion. These are my disclosures, none of which relate to urethral or urological surgery, but to reflect my interest in pharmacology. When you're dealing with any complex surgery, it's very important, particularly in the context of reconstructive surgery, to have the time to devote to it. But also it's essential to be aware of all of the techniques which are available. Because as with any surgery, particularly reconstructive surgery, you have to take it to bits and then put it together. And if you don't know all of the ways of putting it together, because you sometimes get surprises, it can be a problem. Now, obviously, we live in the age of evidence base. And in this context, the problem is that there is very little evidence base in the, con in the field of surgery. What I'm going to go through is a overview of the whole subject, starting with consideration of anatomy, the surgical equipment that you need and the approaches which can be helpful, and then some comments on both the male and the female. Of course, if you're looking at the male, and the same applies to the female, what you're dealing with is blood supply. Of course, in the female, the, or the clitoris has a similar blood supply, but much smaller than the penis. Many people forget when they're dealing with urethral stricture disease that the urethra is a vascular organ not a particularly muscular one, it's vascular. So you're dealing with blood supply, and it's a blood supply that's so important. The next point is to consider the anatomy of the urethra, which varies in different parts of the urethra. So as you can see, just going back to that, if I may, to the previous slide, in the posterior urethra, what you've got is the sphincter mechanism, with very little corpus spongiosum. In the bulbar urethra here, you've got a very thick corpus spongiosum, which is uh, ventrally and dorsally it's thin. And when you get into the penile urethra, there's very little corpus spongiosum. So I'm sure you'd agree there's no surprise that urethrotomies and urethral dilations in this area of the urethra don't work very well, because if you've got an ischemic problem, then there's nothing that's going to happen when you stretch or dilate it. Whereas here, you hope that if you do an optical urethrotomy or dilation, that what you're going to end up is it healing open. And when you come back here, of course, again, there's no corpus uh, spongiosum. You're dealing with a, a sphincter active area. And that, of course, is important because it's one of the two mechanisms that keeps you continent. In the male, of course, you've got the bladder neck, which is powerful to prevent the retrograde emission of semen, retrograde ejaculation, so-called. So you've got the distal sphincter and the bladder neck. In the female, of course, the bladder neck is poorly formed anatomically. Uh, and of course, most of the sphincteric function is in the uh, urethra itself. And in this context, one always has to think of the intrinsic sphincter muscle, the submucosa and the mucosa, and of course, the extrinsic, extrinsic muscle, which is related to the pelvic floor. So moving on to surgical equipment and approaches. I'm very, very cheap as a surgeon. I don't need complex equipment. And with this equipment, I can carry out most urethral surgery. Here you have a Turner Warwick retractor, 
which is a Dennis Brown retractor with these knobs on. And I'll show you the reason for them in a minute. A Haygroves device, which basically has got a hole in the end, and which I find very useful for pulling in a super big catheter and leaving a stitch through to hold in the urethral catheter. A nice needle holder with a curve on it, again a Turner Warwick, because you, you can see over the end of it down a deep dark hole. This faticulum speculum is essential when you're doing urethral surgery, because you can pop it down the urethra and you can actually see the lumen to put a stitch in. And you need a nice sucker, again with a hole in the end so you can grab needles in the end. This sort of retraction is useful when you're doing oral mucosa. The next is the position of the patient. For all urethral surgery, it's perfectly adequate to just go into the standard lithotomy position, but rotate the legs out as far laterally as possible, of course, without putting too much pressure on the lateral aspect of the legs. You don't need to go into this type of um, Hugh Hampton Young type approach. So basically in this context, with the legs out at 30 degrees, you can do everything. This, of course, looks like a rather unusual position, but this is very useful when operating on the female urethra, the Sims position, and I'll show you more about that later. Another approach to get at the urethra in the female is to go above the urethra, as, well as, as long as you don't uh, damage the nerves to the clitoris or the blood supply up here, you should be fine. And you can get perfect uh, retraction. And I also use this retractor which is from the anal surgeons. It's a Parks anal retractor, which gives you excellent exposure, as I'll show you later. So for the supramiatal uh, urethralysis type approach for diverticulum, or even for, for urethral stricture, which is rare, but where you want to put in a graft, then you can actually use this approach. And you're just showing in a patient how easy it is to do. So let's talk now about the male urethra. First of all is terminology. A number of years ago, with a couple of colleagues, I ran the international consultation on urethral disease. And we defined three types of problem in the male. The first is the sphincter stenosis, which we're seeing more and more now following radical prostatectomy. Previously, it was just after transurethral section of the prostate. And in this context, you have to be very careful because the bladder neck mechanism has gone, so this is a main sphincteric mechanism. So what you want to do is to consider just opening it up gently as an intermittent self-dilation. If you're talking about the uh, more distal injuries or distraction injuries, then you've got both the fall astride injuries and of course, more proximally, the pelvic fracture urethral distraction uh, injury. And again, colleagues such as Turner Warwick, Blandy, and others have done an enormous amount of work on that. So that brings us on to the true urethral stricture. Now, I've already emphasized the importance of the corpus spongiosum, which is a good vascular organ. And a true stricture is where you get ischemia of, the fibro of this area, ischemic spongiofibrosis. And of course, the length of the fibrosis will dictate the length of the stricture. So what you see when you look endoscopically or radiologically is often not the whole problem, because you might have a narrowing, but you'll have the ischemic areas either side. And you can look at that with ultrasound. In my uh, practice, what I do is look at it when I'm doing open surgery and see pink tissue which bleeds. And that, of course, is a key point. With this surgery, it's blood supply, blood supply, blood supply. So intrinsic strictures are due to ischemic spongiofibrosis. The next question is success. And of course, success is in the eye of the beholder, and it depends what you use to dictate su success. Going back to Smith, back in 1968, he demonstrated very clearly that you don't, if you've got a normally functioning bladder, get a restriction in flow until the caliber of the urethra is down to 11 French or less. So if you use a flow rate or you use symptoms, then you may overestimate the success rate of your surgery. You can see a case here. That's the endoscopic picture. The urethrogram is a little difficult to interpret 
and you can see not a bad flow rate. I personally think the most accurate way of assessing outcomes is urethrography, but we use in our practice flexible endoscopy, which is very straightforward, it takes less than five minutes because if you're looking at the site of your anastomosis or your augmentation, you don't have to go into the bladder. And there you can see the difficulty interpreting the urethrogram. And of course, there are various ways of assessing symptoms. This was a patient reported outcome measure which was developed in the UK a number of years ago. Let's look now at the posterior urethra. It's very important to assess this accurately and it's essential to do a synchronous study. Most of these patients present with a superbicaster in situ, of course, if not all of them, unless you're doing this acutely, which is very rare. So you need to put contrast down superpubically as well as uh, and retrograde up the urethra. So you can then see the gap here. But of course, you haven't lost much urethra with a pelvic fracture, urethral distraction injury. That's a key point. Just like a fall astride injury, you've ruptured the urethra. You can almost always anastomose these. Well over 95 to 98% can be anastomosed directly. I usually carry out an examination of the urethra and, and also of the bladder prior to surgery. And you can use, to look, use a flexible cystoscope and look down the superbic tract. You can check the bladder neck, check there's no debris or stones or other problems in the bladder. And you can look down the urethra to see the site of the obstruction, which in 40% of cases is distal to the uh, distal sphincter mechanism. Of course, you can look up from below too, which is less productive. Now, there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm for uh, trying to do primary anastomoses and cutting for the light. And here's an example of why you shouldn't do it. You're dealing with a block of fibrous tissue here. You can hear, see here, somebody has broken a sac's urethrotome blade and left it behind. They've done a cutting for the light and gone into the base of the bladder because that's where the bladder neck is. And this is termed, this is termed a perineal operation into complex abdominal perineal operation with no benefit to the patient. And here you can see the consequence in another patient of a realignment. And you can see here that all you've done is to get a tract between the two ends of the urethra. And these patients have a lifelong problem with recurrent infections, stenosis, and so on. As Turner Warwick and others have shown over the years, the key point is to spatulate the urethra. And of course, the key issue is to get in there, get rid of the fibrosis and do this. You can see the spatulation there. So you're actually opening the urethra up widely, holding it open, and then hopefully your anastomosis won't stenose. Now, over the years, it's been clearly shown that there are a number of ways in which you can actually gain a bit of length, because in, other, to get, in other words, to get an overlap of the urethra, you've got to gain some length. And what you can do, the maneuvers I'll just show you now. The first thing to do, of course, is to get the urethra out of the way, and then you can get down to the business in hand and you need to cut out the fibrous tissue after the initial mobilization. You need to divide the corpora cavernosa, and remember there's a big vein just there, which you have to be careful about and control. You can then get your retractors in quite nicely, and then of course, if necessary, you can take out, in addition to the fibrosis, some of the inferior part of the pubis, and then do an anastomosis. In a small proportion, less than 10% of patients, to gain extra length, you can reroute the urethra around one of the uh, corpora, corporal bodies. So certainly if you look at the evidence, and Tony Mundy's done a lot of work in this area, you can see that you, in a series here from him of 82 patients with long-term follow-up, you can see at 10 years, 12% success rate. So moving on now to the anterior urethra. Of course, everybody tends to use optical urethrotomies and urethral dilation with a balloon dilation or using bougies. And here you have one of the few pieces of level one evidence in the literature. This is from Chris Haynes and his group. And they looked at 210 men who were randomized to two groups, urethrotomy or urethral dilation under local anesthetic. And you can see here, the length of the stricture dictated the outcome. And you can see if you've got a short stricture, there's approximately a 60% success rate. 
whereas you've got a longer stricture at 20% success rate after one urethrotomy. And at four years, you can see for these strictures, the success rate was only one in four. And if you look at this, in terms of the way forward, clearly you have to realize the limitations of this technique. There was no difference between dilatation or dilation and urethrotomy. And you can see, looking at recurrent uh, stricturing, that a second procedure is of limited benefit at two years, but wasn't of benefit at four years, and a third treatment was of no value at all. Now, there's quite a literature accruing with mitomycin C. You can see a number of papers here from a recent review we wrote, and an interesting one from the States. Here you can see, showed that there is some benefit injecting mitomycin C into the urethra at the site of the stricture in, a, in, keep, in, in association with the urethrotomy. But of course, this still has to be proven. It's relatively small numbers of patients, and somebody needs to do a randomized study to look at that. There's been a lot of interest over the years in using stents, temporary stents, and really they don't work very well, and so they have been abandoned. Many years ago, I was involved in the development of a permanent stent, the wall stent, and certainly we had very nice initial success, but unfortunately, if you look to the long term, at least 40% failure, and really not to be recommended in contemporary practice. Because at the end of the day, if you have to take it out, you have to take out a bulk of tissue with the stent in, although you can just cut the stent in the midline and pull out the wires and use that as a backplate. But it is more complex a surgery, and really it's not to be recommended. So the message is, one urethrotomy, if you do a second or a dilatation, then advise the patient they probably need to use intermittent dilation for a period of time, and that would be for at least four to six months, and then and to see if it's worked. Of course, if you've got a complex stricture, you may want to go straight on to urethroplasty. And there may be reasons for primary urethroplasty in the penile urethra, long strictures, with balanitis erotic obliterans, multiple strictures, where you've got a strictures which have recurred within six months for the reasons I've mentioned. Those are, of course, refractory to urethrotomy or a complete urethral obliteration. Of course, you need to, to advise the patients about the complications. In the context of the posterior urethra, there's a 15 to 20% risk of erectile dysfunction with the urethroplasty. Happily, less common in the anterior urethra. Most patients experience some post mictrician dribbling after surgery. In most patients, they had it before with the stricture. And of course, because you've done, carried out surgery on the urethra, you may have, made, may have made it more capacious, and often they can find that the oomph they get with ejaculation is far less than before. So they need to be aware of that. Now, if you look at erectile dysfunction, Here's a meta-analysis of 36 studies. You can see de novo erectile dysfunction in the anterior urethra was less than 1%. And you can see, of course, initially there may be problems due to a variety of reasons, psychological discomfort and so on, but it usually settles. So it's important to explain to the patients that there can be some sexual dysfunction, there can be posterior micturition dribbling and ejaculatory dysfunction. So let's move on to the surgery. The reason I like this retractor is because it actually gives, gives you a good grip on the tissues. Of course, there is a Bradley Scott retractor, but I don't like the hooks which tend to tear into the tissues and don't give such a broad base exposure. And here you can see the first part of urethroplasty having mobilized the urethra and the distal bulb so you can get behind it. And of course, these knobs are very useful because you can put stay stitches on for instance, you can see here on the, on the muscle. Now, of course, there's been recent interest. Uh, uh, Babagli suggested you should try and spare the bulbospongiosis muscle, but a recent study which looked at this showed that in a randomized study, a small number of patients that made absolutely no difference, as most of us thought was the case. It's very important when you carry out the surgery to keep the cystoscope attached to the patient, in other words, uh, on scrubbed in with you, because you should be able to use it, of course, for the benefit of the operation. 
So you can actually look where the stricture is and transilluminate, as you can see clearly there. Now, another couple of other tips. I usually, particularly when I'm trading somebody, put a guide wire down. And unless there's complete obliteration of the urethra, you can always get a guide wire through. It's like a filiform and follower. The guide wire will go through the stricture. And you can see going through nicely. Now, the reason that's useful is because when you, when you get down onto the stricture open, it, it allows you to feel where the lumen is, so you can cut directly on it without shredding the urethra. Using transillumination, you can also then put a stitch right at the distal end of the stricture, so you very precisely can identify where it is. Now, of course, what type of urethroplasty? That depends on the length of the stricture, the cause of the stricture, and the previous surgery. So let's look at a short stricture as shown here, one to three centimeters. Again, the techniques that I showed you earlier about mobilizing the urethra, foreshortening course, if necessary, in many cases it's useful to split the corpora if you're dealing with a more proximal bulbar stricture. You can rotate the urethra through 180 degrees so you can get a nice spatulate, and then you can uh, push the urethra down on your uh, sutures. So you've got those different maneuvers that you can use. And if you look at the literature, there's at least a 90% success rate with an anastomotic procedure in expert hands. More recently, the heineken michelitz procedure has been popularized, which is basically to cut across the stricture very precisely, cut out the damaged tissue. You can actually cut out more tissue and join it up. And of course, you can then do it sewing it transversely. The first report with this in modern times was from Belgium, from Osterlink in 2010, and the group at University College London have followed on from that with a, another series, as you can see here. So what type of urethroplasty, the considerations you need to bear in mind? You can't just excise the stricture and restore continuity as in the gut, because you've got to think about the blood supply which comes in from both ends. So you've got to get a good vascularized anastomosis. You often have to mobilize things to get it joined. In the gut, of course, you can easily, as I was doing earlier this afternoon, easily do anastomosis, particularly in the small bowel. So you can, of course, excise and restore continuity if you've got enough length, the anastomotic. Otherwise, you have to augment the urethra. And as I'll show you, we usually now use oral mucosa. And of course, the onlay augmentation can be useful, and really a tube substitution is not to be recommended and really necessary, if ever, in contemporary practice. And wherever necessary in the penile urethra, don't forget the two-stage procedure. And as a last point, don't forget perineal urethrostomy for the elderly patient, lengthy stricture, failed previous surgery. The only downside is they have to sit down to void. So just moving on, let's have a look at what type of approach. What's the difference between grafts and flaps? When I was trained, I was told, never use a graft, always use a flap. But in fact, this excellent meta-analysis from McMackinich's group showed that there's absolutely no difference. And in modern practice, we tend to use grafts. Over the years, we've evolved the type of tissue. People have looked at the wolf graft, but now really, there's no particular role for that in the adult, maybe in some children, but again, probably not. Genital skin, the trouble here is that it doesn't work as well as, for instance, oral mucosa or bladder mucosa, if you can't use oral mucosa, because these are wet tissues, whereas, of course, the penile skin isn't quite so adapted to being in a wet environment. And really, there's no indication now for scrotal skin, and I don't think any of us outside Hamburg use mesh grafts. From China, colonic mucosa has been suggested, but again, I don't know anybody really routinely using that except out of the group that recommended it. And matrix can be used, but again, here you've got to think about what you're doing. If you're putting a matrix in with no cells, then cells have to grow in and the results don't look so good. And of course, there's been enthusiasm in, as in many other areas of urology for tissue engineering. So in this context, we will really consider oral mucosa, occasionally penile skin, particularly for hyperspadius, and really matrix isn't something which would be recommended. You can use flaps, 
They're multiple ones using penile skin, many with names attached to them, but the principle is to pick up a blood supply. But remember the skin is a passenger on the blood supply. And the major problem with these, as from this other level one evidence, was that although the results of graft and flap were similar, there was a lot more morbidity from the donor site with the flap. So really, I don't know anybody who's using these routinely now. Now, oral mucosa, it was suggested this originated from Great Ormond Street in the UK, and then was rediscovered from Germany by pediatric urologist Berger. But in fact, my colleagues in Russia pointed out to me a number of years ago that a Russian colleague in 1894 described it in patients along with a number of animal studies. With oral mucosa, you can take it from the cheek, the lip, or the tongue. The trouble in the adult with the lip is that it causes morbidity and discomfort with in, in, in drawing off the lip, so it's not ready to be recommended. And this was shown very nicely from the, the group of Alken in Germany, that there was a lot more discomfort with lip. Taking the oral mucosa from the cheek is very straightforward. You just have to recognize the position of the parotid duct opposite the upper second molar tooth, and you can easily then mobilize it, get a nice up to six centimeter um, graft, depending on the size of the patient's mouth, but an adult is usually doable. And then closure, really it doesn't matter. I tend to try and draw it together as much as possible, like any wound, because it speeds up healing. But as you look at this work from Margaret Fish, where they did a randomized study, it made no difference at all except of course there was a slightly more morbidity with a longer graft. And of course, just easily taking off the subcutaneous tissues, I tend to use the graft over my finger rather than a cork block. I feel that I've got much more precise control of how deep to go. And what you want to do is to get onto the gray tissue you see there, taking off the fatty tissue and the little bits of muscle that come out when you're taking it out. And they heal very well. Only around 5 to 10% of patients complain of the scar or a little bit of numbness there. And this shows the first publication from, in, from Italy, from Carbinani's group, where, where, you, where they suggested that you could use tongue, what you might call a tongue and cheek operation. And you can see in a two-stage procedure, it healed very well. Now, tissue engineering a number of years ago because of the long strictures we were doing occasionally, and lichen sclerosis, BXO, where you may have to put in 17 centimeters of graft, I looked at tissue engineering, and we were the first in the world to look at tissue engineered oral mucosa, but I was worried about the matrix and felt it wasn't going to be a viable option because of the cost, the need for a class A laboratory, and the fact that in most patients you can get it from the mouth without any morbidity. From Germany, another group have looked at this, and you can see a number of key players in the field who studied this, but you can see at two years, a 40% failure rate in this study. I think that they've overestimated the success rate because they use symptoms and at some flow rates, but not in all, and one or two of the centers had a 0% success rate. So I don't think that's a viable option at the moment. So a stricture will depend upon how long it is, the outcome. Oral mucosa is very effective. Buccal mucosa is therefore the standard of care and it could be harvested very easily and tissue engineering is still experimental. So which type of urethroplasty? So let's talk about the one stages. So the anastomotic procedure I've already mentioned. So what about augmentation for the longer strictures? Well, should you cut across? There's been debate over this, I think, there's no indication for doing this unless you've got complete obliteration of the urethra. In this case, you can see that's the situation. And here you've got the uh, roof strip, which has been reanastomosed, and then you do an onlay graft uh, on the, in a bulba uh, fashion, as you can see from one of Tony Mundy's excellent publications. And the success rate of oral mucosa put in in this context will depend upon the outcome measures that people use. Most people would suggest around an 80 to 85% success rate. So let's look at the onlay augmentation procedure, which of course 
is the most commonly used. Again, where do you cut? You can go ventrally, laterally, or dorsally. Really, I find that going ventrally cause more bleeding, but it's obviously easier because you don't need to mobilize the urethra. But I like the Monser technique popularized by Bagley, where you can cut the urethra dorsally, there's less interference of blood supply, doesn't bleed as much. And by rotating the urethra, uh, as you can see through 180 degrees with stitches, it's very easy to do. We looked a number of years ago at the literature and with the ventral approach, which you can see shown here, where you've plicated the graft onto the corpus spongiosum, you can get results which at around three years, around 84%. This is just to show the Monser technique, which Bob Bagley's popularized by putting in a graft dorsally, which I like, you can see fenestrating it, putting in quilting stitches, and then pulling the graft over. And of course you can combine a dorsal along with a ventral onlay approach for the ones which are more proximal. Again, at around three years, 88%, no different to the ventral. More recently, Kokani has popularized this technique, which is to mobilize the urethra and pull it down. So you can pull the penile urethra down into the perineum and put in a graft and then reanastomose it. The problem is you need to have a caliber here of around eight to 10 French. And if you look at his uh, paper, this is his more recent work where he's left it attached, the uh, urethra and still pulled it down, which seems, makes a lot of sense. But his original paper here, you can see, in fact, there were relatively few patients where they could do a uh, one stage procedure with lichen sclerosis uh, because, of course, of the lumen and the caliber of the lumen. You can use the esopotype technique where you can go through um, ventrally and then dorsally and put in a graft, or you can put in a graft dorsally and ventrally if you like. Again, it comes down to the expertise of the surgeon. Tube grafts, really, I don't suggest because the success rate with these is very low, quite a high failure rate. I mean, if we see this with two stage procedures where you, in 10% of cases at least, have to do something to actually correct uh, narrowing or whatever else uh, of the first stage. And don't forget the perineal urethrostomy, as I mentioned earlier. So the tube two stage graft is, of course, very useful for the penile urethra. If you've got a complex stricture, then of course you want to do an artificial erection to see if there is any cordy. As you can see there, and then you need to mobilize that. The urethra will obviously then migrate more proximally. It's the meatus, and you have to warn the patients about that beforehand. You can put in a nice graft of tissue. I tend to use, uh, you can see um, metronidazole, not metronidazole, clonfenicol, I mean, um, ointment, which I put on, uh, and then a, a nice plastic surgical dressing, which is tied on left for five days. Unfortunately, we still see the so-called hyperspadiac cripples. If one's looking at a patient with hyperspadiac problems, particularly dealing with an adult, then you have to consider the fact that you're dealing not only with a cosmetic abnormality and a functional abnormality, but also the psychological factors associated with that as a consequence of the patient feeling, as you might say, not normal. This causes intense embarrassment to the patient. And you've got to take this into account when you're dealing with this problem. So looking at our experience here, you can see that over the last few years, we've had a number of patients presenting, and this is a series which we looked at, as you can see here, uh, looking at 79 patients who presented in adulthood with the consequences of either untreated, but usually treated and failed hyperspadiac surgery. And the key factor is that using all of the techniques which are available, in particular starting with a two-stage uh, urethroplasty in most of them, uh, you may need more than two or even three operations, but you can inevitably get the situation significantly improved uh, for the patient. And as you can see here, the majority end up with a wider open urethra, and you can see that they, there may be a need for redo second stage procedures in a small proportion, but the majority of patients are very happy at four years. So the take home message is with any urethral surgery, the first operation is likely to be most successful.
Use the simplest technique that is likely to be effective. Avoid putting in a substitution of other tissues such as oral mucosa uh, whenever possible because doing a direct anastomosis is likely to have the best outcome for the patient in the long term. But of course, if you need to substitute, then do so. Grafts are more commonly used now than flaps because of the fact that there is not the donor site morbidity of a flap and the results seem to be identical. And oral mucosa is probably, one can say, the standard of care now, uh, with a backup being uh, bladder mucosa, uh, for instance, and of course, penile skin if necessary. So, how to assess failed surgery? Then one's got to think of um, the problem that you're dealing with. Is it a penile recurrence? These are more likely to be challenging because of the poor blood supply and the lack of subcutaneous tissues, and hence the need for two-stage procedures. A bulbar recurrence, certainly we know that 10% of patients have a diaphragm which forms following a urethroplasty, and if you just divide that, usually just dilated, it doesn't come back in the majority of cases. Occasionally, you do end up with a restenosis, and the results of that are that they do just as well as a primary procedure. But clearly, there's a lot of scarring, and it needs somebody with the expertise to go in who feels confident to do that. For full-length procedures, then obviously you need to bear in mind how fit the patient is, because if it's an elderly person, the question is whether if they've got other medical comorbidities, you really want to go down the line of major surgery, or will they be happy with a perineal urethrostomy, or of course, if the stricture um, is easy to dilate, the alternative is a clean intermittent self catheterization to carry out autodilation of the stricture. So, obviously, it's important to think of anatomical considerations. The equipment, as I've mentioned to you, and in the male patient, the posterior and anti-urethra. So let's have a look at the female urethra now. Now, urethral strictures, of course, are very uncommon in women, but if they pose a significant problem because clearly the female urethra is sphincter active along its length. And a number of years ago, we looked into the evidence base relating to the management of female strictures. And you can see in the literature from this paper in 2013, there were only just over 220 patients reported. So it's clearly not a common uh, surgical procedure, urethroplasty for strictures in the female. If one looks into the history, you can see that this was reviewed right back as far as 1951. And certainly of the 200 cases in the literature, we realize that you can use a number of different tissues. You can use the labia minora, vestibular tissue, and more recently, of course, oral mucosa. And that's the tissue that I personally favor because I think it gives a good result and it gives you easy access. Of course, not surprisingly, there are various ways of tackling this. You could, of course, have inlay flaps uh, because of the use of adjacent tissue in the vagina. And you can see very similar approaches that you would use in the male patient. But of course, in the vagina, you've got, an, you've got access to the vestibular tissue as well as the labia. And indeed, if one looks at the oral mucosa and the literature relating to this, it's exactly the same as in the male. Now, of course, the problem here is that you're dealing with a sphincter active urethra, quite distinct to the male. And really the question with this is what impact that has on sphincteric function and does the patient end up incontinent afterwards? And surprisingly, when you look in the literature, something which I certainly don't understand, you can do a full length urethroplasty on the sphincter active female urethra and the patient is still continent. And that's in the majority of cases. So it's an issue that nobody can really explain. Uh, so that's something that needs to be looked into in the future. I personally like the dorsal approach. And you can do this by the, the superurethral incision that I showed earlier in the talk. If we look at the literature, looking at the results, you can see this is one of the larger series, 17 patients, that you can see the outcome. But the, it, most of the patients have a fairly short-term follow-up, and I would suspect 
there are more problems with the surgery than have been reported in the literature to date. Another important issue dealing with the female urethra is urethral diverticula. And the most important thing is to bear in mind that a diverticulum is breaching the whole of the female sphincter mechanism because it's usually due to, or thought to be due to, inflammation in a periurethral gland. And these open into the lumen of the urethra and hence a true urethral diverticular always communicate with the urethral lumen. Of course, if they're communicating with the urethral lumen, they then protrude through the sphincter mechanism and in carrying out any sort of excision of this, one's therefore operating on the female urethral sphincter. We looked into this in our own experience and our initial experience was of a number of patients who would presented over the years. We're now up to more than 160 patients. This is going back to uh, an article which we published a number of years ago. And you can see here the, the way in which one has to consider where a diverticulum is in relationship to the sphincter. You can see it's acting almost like a tissue expander pushing through the sphincter. Of course, MRI is the most effective way of diagnosing the presence of a diverticulum and sorting out its configuration. And you can see with any uh, diverticulum, it's important to have this information before operating on the patient. You can see here that the outcomes are obviously important because it's a sphincter active area. And a number of patients are incontinent prior to surgery and approximately 15% of them have their incontinence cured by the surgery because you've taken away the diverticulum. About 15% who are dry develop incontinence afterwards. So you have to counsel the patient and they have to be prepared for the consequences. And if necessary, I would I recommend to them a, 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 a mid-urethral loose autologous sling, which can work. Here you can see a standard approach using uh, the patient in the prone position. So they're lying on their face. I showed you that position earlier. In this case, because I was concerned, we might be extending back to the ureters. I put in stents um, up both ureters as well as obviously a urethral catheter. I usually leave these patients with a suprapubic catheter as well as a urethral catheter. And it's important to bear in mind that before you place the patient in the prone position, then you need to put in the suprapubic and the ureterics whilst they are supine. It's impossible to catheterize ureters prone. I once tried that and it was impossible. Had to turn them supine again. So do that in advance before you turn them prone. The retractor I use is a Park Sanal retractor. I mentioned that earlier. And you can see that gives excellent um, opening of the vagina. Once you've mobilized the vaginal flap, then you're right down onto the uh, muscle uh, and the periurethral tissues. You can see it's important to have enough vascularity on the flap, but not go too deep. And once you get into that plane, you can get down then onto the urethra. Here you can see I've pulled, you can see the stay stitches either side, which are holding the urethral sphincter muscle, and then I've gone down onto the diverticulum. And then one can close the having removed the diverticulum, cl close the urethra, pulling it together nicely. And if necessary, if it's quite a larger section like this one, then go in there and mobilize a martis flap, which you can happily do with the patient prone. And then close up and put a pack in. I tend to leave a superbic and urethral catheter on free drainage for three weeks. I remove the vaginal pack and the donor side dressings at about 24 hours and certainly use oral antibiotics while, when I'm operating on the vagina like this using uh, an agent such as metronidazole and a broad spectrum agent for three days and then an oral agent until the catheter's come. Of course, when dealing with a female urethra, a very topical issue are problems with mesh. Now, mesh, of course, we all know is based on usually polypropylene, which was developed for uh, inguinal hernia repair. But the problem with that 
was that it produced a number of problems when used for hernias, and that led on to the AMET classification of type 1 mesh with a 75 micron pore size was recognized as being the optimal configuration. Now, this, of course, then led on to the same material being placed in the vagina without any animal work being carried out or without adequate assessment. And clearly, polypropylene is very effective. It produces intense fibrosis and scarring, which is what you want, because that's how it provides, if you like, a backplate for the urethra. I know there's the hypothesis uh, which came out of Uppsala about pariurethral ligaments and so on, but I personally think you're putting in a backplate of tissue. Of course, over the years, people have tried alternatives, biological substitutes, xenografts and allografts, but they ha have a low complication rate, but a high failure rate because of the T cell response where the tissue you put in, which is foreign protein, is resolved. Of course, autologous tissue is the optimum, but has a downside of the donor site morbidity. But of course, that also gets integrated and doesn't erode and produces a good uh, ingrowth of fibrous tissue. So there's no ideal material, but that's what one has to consider. And certainly, we do know that the synthetic mesh uh, sling procedure is the treatment of choice, and this is in the EAU guidelines confirming that. Of course, because of all of the controversy relating to this, it's important to look at this from a consensus point of view, and the EAU held just as such a consensus a few years ago. Here you can see the group, uh, multidisciplinary urologists, gynecologists with an interest in urology, and basic scientists, tissue engineers. And the principle is that, of course, you need to have proper assessment of the patient. So any surgery such as this should only be carried out by individuals who properly assess the patient and know how to case select. It's important to have proper training, although it may seem a simple technique. I personally think that a lot of the exposures of mesh are due to the fact that the vaginal um, tissue ha has had its vascularity compromised. It's very important for the patients to be adequately informed, and of course, it's very important for the complications if they occur, which inevitably will happen with any surgery, to be documented and reported. Indeed, if you go back into the literature, as I'm sure you know, uh, Ward and Hilson first described the use of the TVT following on from the uh, work which came out of Uppsala from Petrus and Olmsten. And they carried out the randomized control trial comparing this to corpus suspension. And indeed, if you go into the literature on this, you can see that they recognized after by five years there was a 4% exposure rate of mesh. And of course, what happened after that one study with just a few hundred patients in a randomized fashion for about a year, this is what happened in the literature. You had all of these techniques which were introduced with no evidence base. And I think there's a valuable lesson there for us in medicine that one should always look before you leap into new techniques. And of course, we do know the use of this for prolapse surgery has led to even worse problems with exposure and up to 30% in some cases because of the large surface area of this material that's used. And of course, this has led on to consequences. Just a brief look at the internet will reveal this very clearly with a number of patient action groups. This, of course, is inevitably, particularly in countries such as North America, led on to a number of lawsuits. And this has also led on to a lot of concern for patients. Indeed, in the UK, because of political issues, it has resulted in the um, banning, for the time being, of the use of synthetic mesh materials uh, for the treatment of stress urinary contact. If one actually looks objectively at mesh erosion, it's not that common, uh, but certainly you can see that the, it, it depends on the expertise of the surgeon, the circumstances, and so on. But one has to be prepared for the fact that there may be a, an exposure rate of up to 2 to 3 percent across the board. And a number of patients have been admitted, you can see in this review of experience in the UK from our Nationalized Health Service, 
we're up to 6% of patients being readmitted for further interventions. And of course, it's not just exposure. Patients do get pain in the vagina within causes of sexual dysfunction and pain in the, in the pelvis and also in the thighs if they've had a transoperative tape procedure. So if one looks at it from a UK perspective, we have this difficult situation that the government at the moment has suspended the use of mesh. And we're obviously in a bit of a dilemma because the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, has recently suggested that it is a treatment of choice, but the government, the politicians, have got it still suspended. If one looks at the uh, period procedure complications, then this is what you can see from the review of our experience in the UK, TVT around 3%. TOT 1.5%, and for exposure, you can see that it's up to 2.4%, uh, and we're all familiar with seeing this picture with patients with vertebrae. Now, the reason why I'm putting this into talk on the urethra is clearly just underneath this mesh is the urethra, and so somebody has to be confident to removing this. I think it is behold on us to work in a multidisciplinary team setting, with our gynecological colleagues, and if there are problems where mesh has been used for rectoceles with our colorectal surgeon colleagues. The, expo the removal of this type of exposure is very straightforward. If you're used to urethral surgery, you have access to the approaches I've shown you to actually get exposure to the urethra. A more complicated situation is a rare instance of erosion into the urethra. It's clearly here, then any re reconstruction here involves a urethroplasty, and this brings into play all the points I've mentioned earlier in terms of expertise for urethral surgery. Now, I know that people have looked into these, they've pulled the mesh out, they've used laser to burn it, but remember this is a transmural uh, exposure. In other words, the mesh is going in one side of the urethra and out the other, and in the long term, these patients get recurrent problems. So it's probably better to sort it out. And indeed, if this is eroded into the urethra, they'll often have recurrent incontinence. So it's important to do this effectively at the start. And you can see in this case, there's also a stone that's formed on the mesh. So autologous slings are very effective. They haven't been used widely because patients will often, if given the option, go for a synthetic material. But if you counsel patients effectively and appropriately, I've always found approximately a third of patients will go for an autologous material. And an autologous material, you can see, uh, it, you can use different configurations. We've now evolved over the years from being a full-length um, autologous sling into a sling on a string type approach. And the point is that you mustn't tie it too tight. I know that traditionally autologous slings have been used for type 3 incontinence tight to the bladder neck. But indeed, if you look at this paper from our group, from the British Journal of Urology, this was a 10-year randomized study, which we did in-house with colleagues in other centers in the UK. And we had, as you can see on here, three materials, Pelvicol, which was a porcine substitute, TVT, and autologous sling. And you can see, shown in the pinkish color there, the autologous sling was at least as effective, if not slightly more, 10 years than the TVT, with no higher um, obstruction, because if you put in these sling on a string procedures, mid urethral and loose, you're not going to have major problems beyond the first two or three weeks. You may wish to look at the technique that we advocate, and this is uh, in surgery on motion on the AU, and that will give you a good idea as to how to do this. But of course, all surgery is dependent on the surgical expertise, knowledge base, and carrying out a number of these procedures. You can see that it comes down to the amount of mesh that's used. You can see that from this data here. Obesity, of course, obese patients do less well with any surgery for stress urinary incontinence. And of course, experience, experience, experience is important in surgery. And you can see the same goes for not only, as I've shown you there, in general, in general terms for surgery, but also for urethral surgery. Just to mention, 
an initiative the European Association has been very heavily involved in, along with the European Commission, was to set up a reference network in urology, the Eurogen program. And this program has one of the three topics which it deals with, which is complex um, reconstructive problems affecting the urethra, uh, the lower urinary tract, and of course the upper urinary tract. And so this has easy access to people to actually discuss cases in a secure environment online and get ex expertise from some of the more experienced groups in Europe who've dealt with the rarer conditions. So I recommend to you to look that up, look at Eurogen on Euroweb, and of course, if you want to use the service, you might find it helpful uh, in dealing with some of your more complex cases. So take home message is do what is possible. There's no such thing as brave surgeons, just brave patients. Follow basic surgical principles. Of course, excise damaged tissue. Bring in vascularized tissue. Even when you're bringing in a flap, the tissue you're bringing in on a flap is a passenger on the subcutaneous vascularized tissue. Fill dead space to prevent infection and bleeding. Drain when necessary and defunction so you don't have urine causing a problem until the patient uh, has had things heal. And be aware of the surgical options. At the end of the day, you never know what you're going to do with this surgery, particularly urethral surgery, until you're halfway through. You have to think of it as a take it to bits and put it together procedure. And you don't know what you're going to put together until you've taken it to bits. Of course, I'd love to take questions, and I see some are coming in already. So let me just look through those now. We have one from um, Omar Bayrak. Do you perform CIC after failed urethroplasty daily or weekly? A very good question. I think it depends on what the failure is and what extent the recurrent stricture is. In many patients, if they get a diverticular, uh, sorry, if they get a diaphragm, as I mentioned to you, just dilating that will often cure the problem. So I would dilate that and then get the patient to self-dilate it twice a week for approximately six weeks and then have another look at the urethra after three months and see, and the majority have healed. If there's a recurrent stricture at a later date, then certainly you can dilate it. But in, in these cases, just as for straightforward uh, urethrotomy, if it's failed, once it's going to fail again, and in these cases, if they don't want to undergo further urethral surgery, then long-term intermittent self-dilation for approximately six months in the first instance is appropriate. I'd usually start with a 16 or 18 catheter after doing the urethrotomy or dilatation uh, and, and ask them to do it two or three times a week and then after a month dropping down to once or twice a week or even once a week and then they can prolong it out to 10 days, two weeks. It all depends on how difficult they find it to get the catheter in when they self-dilate and so it's a matter of playing that by ear. Ram Dirk Hari has put a question in. What is the option for recurrence of meatal or submeatal stenosis after the first uh, procedure, the first meatal dilation? Can you manage in a DGH? Well, if you've dilated it, then certainly then you can get the patient to self-dilate a meatal stenosis with a spigot, sort of cone-shaped type device. So there's one commercially that's available, or you can even use the spigot that it comes that you can use for closing off catheters. I would not recommend opening up the meatus and splitting it, a procedure that was first popularized by John Blandy, because they end up spraying and are worse off than before. And if obviously the patient can't self-dilate, it's causing problems, or the stenosis is going upstream even further, then one may have to consider a formal reconstruction, which is, un is usually a two-stage procedure, as I've already mentioned. Kamran Bart Barty, thank you for your question. When to ideally open the, the, the dressings post urethroplasty? I normally leave a dressing on with elasticated uh, uh, understock understockings or knickers with pressure on there for three to four days. The patient, of course, got catheters in. That's not a problem. And I take the dressings down at four days 
I don't drain urethroplasties, and I've never had any major, and it's always difficult to say in surgery, never. I've never had major problems with hematomata uh, using that approach. Obviously, uh, if you're doing an onlay graft, such as a first-stage urethroplasty, it's a different type of dressing. I use a plastic surgical dressing where I tie the dressing on, uh, usually using chlorophenical iron, as I showed you, and I usually leave that for five days, and we inevitably get more than 95% graft take. Mario, uh, Estradar, uh, Loyo, thank you very much indeed. Uh, what you've asked is, do you recommend urine culture in all preoperative patients, and what prophylactic scheme? Yes, certainly all the patients we operate on undergo preoperative assessment, part of which is just to check the urine. You don't want to compromise things by going into an infected environment. And the prophylaxis that I use, I probably overuse antibiotics, probably a generational thing. I tend to use a cephalosporin um, or penicillin, a gentamicin, a metronidazole on, on induction, particularly if you're taking oral mucosa, because the mouth's a very dirty environment, and you're then taking tissue from a dirty environment and putting it in. And I've not uh, really, touch wood, had any major problems with infection over the last 10 to 15 years when we looked at our series, it was far less than 1%. So now I've got another question from Athan Sios, excuse my pronunciation, George Alice, who's asked the question, for cases of urethral meatal stenosis or stricture, uh, initial as initial approach, would you favor meatoplasty? As I've mentioned, meatal dilation is very effective in these cases, in many cases, and meatoplasty is quite a large undertaking for the patient. So I wouldn't go for meatoplasty as the first option. Next question is from Chriso Valantis um, Gekas. Uh, the question is, when repairing a, a small, let's say 0.5 fistula, after a redo adult hyperspadiate operation, how long would you wait before the closure and in case of DARTOS inadequacy, would you consider tunica vaginalis flat? Well, you're talking here about a moderate sized fistula. I think it'd be unwise to operate too acutely. You want all the tissues to have healed as well as possible. And I usually, as a rule, leave things at least three months and explain this to the patient who understands. Inevitably, I found that I can pretty well always close just by using the subcutaneous tissues either side and pulling them across. I don't normally have to use tunica vaginalis. If it is a submeatal stricture, which it usually is at the angle of sorrow between the shaft and glands penis, then it's difficult to bring up tissue from the scrotum. It's a much more major procedure, not really necessary. Next question is from Valeria Hunores. And the question is, I'm from Argentina, had pelvic instability in, in surgeries with pelvic uh, resections. I'm not quite sure, uh, Valeria, what the question is. Um, when you say pelvic instability, have you had a pelvic fracture? Of course, you need to get that the bony problem sorted out before carrying out any urethral reconstructive surgery. From Faras, uh, Cassel, Cassel, Cassefi, and really you know, the question here is based on experience, what is the best practice, catheter type and size and schedule, time and duration for post-internal urethrotomy self-dilatation? Well, I normally leave in a 18 French catheter overnight, to be honest. I know there's a school of thought leaving a catheter in for one or two weeks helps, but I've never been convinced, and I've never seen any evidence to support that view. I think if you've opened it up, then certainly it's either going to stay open or not, if it's a first-time uh, urethrotomy. If it's not a first-time urethrotomy, then I always use the uh, self-dilation for the patient. And as I've mentioned earlier, I would suggest a regimen which you dictate, which is dictated by the length of the, the stricture. And so, in other words, I would tend to get them on to auto dilation as soon as possible, usually at about 
four or five days afterwards when it's not so painful. Next one is Margarita uh, Moga. How long do you keep the urinary catheter on post-op? Usually uh, Margarita for two weeks in the first instance and then I, because I put a superbicone urethral catheter in, get the radiologist to put some dye down the superbic catheter, get the patient to void around the urethral and in 95% of cases we can remove the catheters sequentially, urethral out, clamp the superbic, they just do come up to the hospital in the outpatients, we do this. In 5%, we have to leave the catheter on the week or two, particularly for the very lengthy uh, reconstructions where then things may not have healed completely. The next question is from Aman Trio Oliveira. What do you recommend a patient with long penile urethral stricture, five centimeters and a bulbar stricture, about one centimeter in the same patient? I would recommend a urethroplasty. A long penile stricture isn't going to respond in the long term to surgery unless they use, with a urethrotomy, unless they use uh, self-dilation in the long term. So that's up to the patient. And if you're going in to do uh, these operations, you might as well do both at the same time. There's no point just doing one and coming back to do the other. Next question is from the Dedian Apondo. Does the age of the patient determine if you consider primary urethroplasty or DVIU and then urethroplasty in case of failure? I think it's always worth offering a patient with a bulbar stricture a urethrotomy, particularly if it's a short one. If it's a very lengthy one with BXO or a lengthy penile stricture, then it's, you can certainly counsel the patient for primary urethroplasty. But certainly, if you've got an elderly patient, particularly uh, with a stricture, it's worth the, doing the least necessary uh, even in a younger patient, of course. So I wouldn't rush at a urethroplasty in a short bulbar stricture. From Robert um, Lee uh, Pedra Goza, do you have any experience in using intraurethral gel? Uh, you're talking here about sepe, heparin, or allantoin. I haven't had, to be honest, uh, Robert. I've been to, to see what the evidence in the literature is for that. I did mention the use of mitomycin, which is thought to inhibit the inflammatory response and aid healing without scarring, but time will tell. If somebody needs to do a proper study, then we'll be able to advance knowledge. Andre Alexandra uh, Pomaku, can you recommend us some books for urethroplasty? Well, to be honest, I think it comes down to experience looking at the surgical videos and obviously if you can doing a fellowship with somebody who has experience that area it's very difficult to learn urethroplasty from a book because it's like all the surgery it's a matter of judgment it's all very well knowing what the techniques are but it's then judging it's tissue handling it's plastic surgery principles it's a whole ethos of it so i'm not trying to sound, sound elitist but i think it is important to get hands-on training, not just a book. Now, I've got a number of questions from Gabriel Produ. Thank you very much for your kind comments about the talk. The first question is, does urethrography, is it sufficient to evaluate the real situation of a stricture preoperatively? I find it so, yes. It tells me what the configuration is. I know that there is a school of thought that ultrasound is better because you could look at the intramural fibrosis. But to be honest, I sort that out at the time of surgery because I can see if the tissues are pinkish, in other words, vascularized or white, which is scarred, and I excise and open up until I get back to vascularized tissue. So certainly you can use ultrasound as well, but as a rule of thumb, a urethrogram shows you the length and configuration and position of the stricture. Next question, cystoscopy at the beginning of the surgery? Yes, I always perform it at the beginning, as I showed you, because then you can see where the stricture is. You can identify exactly where the distal end is. I don't think you can do this surgery without identifying where the stricture is. And if you don't open it directly on the end of the stricture, then move proximally, you're very likely to, in some cases, turn a potential anastomotic procedure into an augmentation. Well, it depends what surgery the patient's had before. Obviously, if they had a radical prostatectomy, then they've lost the blood flow upstream. If they've had radiotherapy, then of course the blood supply will not be so good. But in a, in a straightforward case, then we do know 
that the, the blood supply to the urethra is segmental, and this then, of course, is the reason why we've got the VJ, uh, uh, not VJ, uh, uh, the, the, I'll redo this one. Shall I redo that one? Yeah, yeah there's no problem. Okay. I just got it out. Yeah. So, uh, VJ, what's the date? You do the, just do the question from the beginning. Yeah, I do the yeah. question. Um, procedure, which is... Or you can skip it. Can't can't date. Yeah. Okay. Does mobilization affect vascular blood flow of the urethra and in turn affect end results? Yes, I think this is a very good question. I think that obviously vascularity is everything. You're dealing with a vascular structure. If the patient's had previous surgery, then certainly... Uh, that this could affect matters. For instance, if they had a radical prostatectomy, uh, then, uh, then, of course, the blood flow upstream will be damaged. If they've had radiotherapy, the blood flow will, of course, be damaged by the post-radiotherapy changes. But, of course, as we know from the Sanjay Kulkarni technique, the urethra has a segmental blood supply, so you can mobilize the whole urethra right from the vulvar urethra up to the, to the glands. Uh, without compromising blood flow. So I think as a rule, as long as you're familiar with the techniques, it's not a big issue. The next question you've posed is, do you prefer dorsal, onlay, or ventral? I personally like dorsal or lateral rather than ventral because there's less bleeding during the procedure and you're not compromising the blood flow to the more vascularized part of the urethra. That's a personal view. As I showed in the talk, the evidence is that both ventral and dorsal have similar results in expert hands. And your last question, is there any way to objectively assess spongy fibrosis? Yes, apart from the visual approach, which I have mentioned to you earlier, looking for bleeding and pinkness, then ultrasound has been recommended by a number of people. But that's not been widely adopted. Another question now from Emil um, Ranazirabo. In second stage urethroplasty, in anterior urethras, what options do you have? So, well, the option you have with second ure stage urethroplasty is really to raise the uh, tissues from the first stage without compromising the blood flow. So, in other words, not undermining the tissue, inlaying it, and most importantly, bringing in vascularized tissue over it. Don't just worry about bringing the skin in. Remember, the skin is a passenger. It's the subcutaneous tissues that are important. And if you get the subcutaneous cover right, the skin will look after itself. But obviously, for cosmetic reasons, you want to get good skin cover too. So those are the key principles of the second stage. But even allowing for that, at the angle of sorrow on the penis, just at the junction of the glands and of the uh, shaft, that's where you do see fistulae even in the most expert hands, in up to 20%, 20 to 30% of cases, depending on the complexity of the patient and how bad the tissues were in the blood supply in the past. But you can always get those healed by a further procedure. Last question is from Shithan Vien. What is the ideal management of long proximal bulbar urethral strictures? How is it different from management of mid and distal urethral strictures. Well, really, the management is very similar. It's really, if it's a lengthy stricture, doing an augmentation. The difference is, if you're proximal, is that you may have to divide the corpora cavernosa in the midline, get between the corporal bodies, and separate them, as I showed you for pelvic fractures, which gives you access to that area. You can inlay a graft, ventrally if you wish, or you can even put it in dorsally. If you use a thedicillum speculum I showed you, you can do that. But of course, it's a bit more challenging. It's getting more towards the techniques that you use for posterior urethral surgery. But again, that's what I've used over the years with success rates similar to more distal strictures. For the distal strictures, I think I've shown you during the talk the ways in which I tackle this. I'd like to thank everybody for listening to this talk and for the excellent questions that have been submitted. And look forward to seeing you at future EAU activities. Good evening to you.